I'm Angela. And I'm Gregor. And we're part of many Access Community programs that you can tune into throughout the week. We're proud to present you today a special episode for Aboriginal Day with never before shown segments. Produced for shows that we're involved in, such as the Sound Therapy Art TV and Will the Salmon Show. Before we start, we'd like to acknowledge that this program was produced in unceded Coast Salish territories. And we'd like to thank the Coast Salish people for allowing us to be here. We, we hope, hope you enjoy, enjoy the, the show. show. In this episode, our production team went on the streets of downtown Vancouver with 70,000 other people to help exposing the cruelsome part of our very local colonial history and present. People across Canada need to understand the res what happened to us, our history with residential schools. They don't understand it. Some people think, oh, just forgive and forget. No, it's not like that. You don't just forgive and forget something that. And people think it was just a long time ago, and no, it wasn't a long time ago. The last residential school closed in 1996. My English name is Charlene Alec, and I'm from Slaywood Nation. Let me reflect for a moment on the very first day of the Truth and Reconciliation event. We had a traditional ceremony to feed our ancestors and the survivors that have passed. The ones present were responsible to share the message that came across, and the message was very clear. Our ancestors are walking with many other races, shoulder to shoulder, hand to hand, in the hopes of reconciliation. And they're smiling down upon us today for the work that we have done all week because here we are walking shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand in hopes for a better future for our children and in our nations and all people. Not so much wallowing. You could hear them all on the beach as they arrived in their canoes. That's what they were saying. One heart, one people. The other message was us two-legged, all us human beings, to stop hurting each other. Walk together in peace and harmony. Stop the hurt. Be the ones. Be the ones to teach our children to stop that cycle. We followed the celebration through the city and even the pouring rain seemed to be read as acknowledging tears from the people before us that were on the right track. It is hard to overlook the controversy about the commission, however, this day belonged to the survivors. Let us invite you to recap a fragment what is needed to end the war against humanity. And so on this day, when we have called together all the people of this great city who have worked hard this week, along with all of you survivors and all of you from the families and the communities of survivors, to spend time with us at the Commission. 
from all of the people from this great city who have gathered here this morning to walk with you, to show that they are with you in your struggle to find reconciliation in this country, however that may be defined by you or by us. Um, it's going good. It's really pumped to have our youth um, here with us today from Red Fox Healthy Living Society. We're here supporting survivors and the intergenerational effects that um, has trickled down to us, and we're here in support and just uh, just walking here in, um, in solidarity because it's affected a lot of communities, and um, you know we're here to start the healing. That's what it's all about is the healing. I've been serving coffee since this morning. The way I felt when I seen all these people go by is just uh, I felt all the power and all of the like their like emotions in a way like and it felt really proud like people coming out even in the rain when it's like pouring rain people are still willing to come out and support this march so i was really happy to see it my name is rob nye I come from the couch in mustimok and uh, as a visitor i've come here in a good way stand with my ancestors the allies of people for indigenous rights not just the first peoples but people need to understand that this is also for the indigenous rights of all people on this land, that we share this land with our neighbors, our relatives, and all the ancestors of humankind immemorial. Things like this got to make it public so people know the real truth of what's happened. It's got to come out and come out and come out. Because the government is muzzling a lot of our events. And I find that very offensive to, to all of Canada, really, because the public's got to know, it's got to come out. It's, it's really powerful, you know, this is what I've always envisioned since I was a young person, right? It's just like all of us collaborating together and fighting for the greater cause and we're not, you know, we're not competition. It's like we're here together as one and that's what this event is about. It's like we are all one people. We're not, you know, we're not just First Nations. We're not just non-Indigenous. It's like we're human beings and that's what, um, you know, this walk is about is bringing awareness to that. There's no divisions of who we are and um, how we identify ourselves. That is important to um, celebrate diversity but at the same time we need to be together as a collective and, and just like, you know, celebrate. Like we're people, we're human beings, you know? It's, this is powerful. It's raining outside. You see how many people are out here today? It, it really warms my heart and it really like, it, it stirs up something inside of me that I hope is, that everyone else is feeling right now. I'm thrilled to be here. I really, really feel um, humbled and blessed to be here on, uh, on a beautiful, cleansing, rainy day uh, with so many amazing, incredible people. Um, I really feel uh, that all of us came here with a spirit of healing and uh, a spirit of togetherness. And we're all feeding off of each other. And there's an incredible energy to be here today. And I really feel really quite humbled and blessed to be here. from the Musqueam Nation. And with me today is my son, Eli, <laughs> whose grandmother, whose grandmother is a survivor of residential schools. And I stand here today with my son with a renewed sense of hope, a renewed sense of pride. I see the hope when I see each and every one of you out there standing side by side, wanting to walk, walk with your brothers, walking with your sisters, more importantly, walking with our residential school survivors. For far too long, for far too long, those that went to those schools were ignored. Their hurt was pushed aside. But in our communities, we all know, we all know too well the hurt that they felt. We, we all saw it as they moved on in life. And in 2008, in 2008, our Prime Minister stood up in the House of Commons and apologized. Apologized to each and every one of the residential school survivors living that have passed. But as we know, as we know with any hurt, the apology is just the first step in healing. We must now move forward hand in hand 
We must move forward and not rely on government to help us heal. We must rely on one another, each other, our brothers and our sisters, our friends, our family, because it's truly those that have come out, as we say in our community, when somebody's hurting, just your presence is medicine. Just your presence and your hug and your talking to each and every person that has gone through those tough times is medicine. And once again, as I say, I see and I feel a profound sense of hope now, a sense of hope that Eli will grow up. We don't have to talk about reconciliation because we will be reconciled when Eli is older. And it's up to us. Our schools aren't teaching our history. It's up to Aboriginal people to share our history in our words, and we will heal and overcome. Thank you. In the next segment, our Wild Salmon Children's News reporters, Nitra and Aisha, will interview one of the directors of the Wildy Salmon Show, creator of Raven Tales, and Universal Artist, Simon James. Hi, I'm Nitra. And I'm Ayesha. And, and we're, we're reporting for, for the WSCN, Wild Salmon, Salmon Children's, Children's News. News. Um, today we're interviewing Simon. He is the director, am I right? Yes. Of several shows here. And He's just an altogether awesome guy. And so we are going to be interviewing him for now. Hi. Hello. What's up? Directing. That's what's up. <laughs> um, how, how is it that you direct? What is it that, what is the qualifications? A brain. Need for it? Having a brain that functions is very Don't important. Don't we all, most of everyone has one. So can't everyone be a director? Have you walked around the city? Not everyone has a functioning brain. Maybe Trust a mouse? <laughs> a mouse can be a director. They have functioning brains and they're very intelligent. Well, possibly. Uh, There's some character mouses out there that are probably great directors. <laughs> what about... Like, would you judge that who would be a better director, a mouse or a cat? I would think that a cat would be a better director. It's a little more intimidating. <laughs> Well, yes, but uh, um, uh, I believe it was rats who were who looked like my so who uh, carried the uh, germs uh, of the black plague. So uh, they are pretty tough and pretty intimidated when it comes to it. They can be. I would assume that the black plague is a very intimidating disease. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they carried it. So. That's what and I so heard that's too. That's where the song came. Playing around the reality. What's the most exciting thing about being a director? What's the most? Oh, let me think. The most exciting thing about being a director, I would say, is meeting Will. new people. Um, uh, how about, um, what are the challenges you've had to face when uh, you uh, are a director? Technical difficulties. Always technical difficulties. How do you solve technical difficulties? Do you get some, like, tech guys to come in? Or do you have to, like, oh, what do I do? Button, 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 button. Oh, this one just made it worse. Button. There we go. No, you make sure that you have a good crew. And if a good crew is doing their job properly, then technical difficulties go away very quickly. Then you said that the challenge is technical difficulties, so that means that you, doesn't, you don't have a very good crew. No, no, no. No matter how good your crew is, there's always going to be technical difficulties. What kind? Well, you could have audio difficulties. You can have uh, the microphone maybe moving around too much and causing audio feedback. You can have a camera that's not quite focused properly, or maybe a cameraman or camera person isn't quite focused on their job and sometimes they might drift, so you have to remind them to get back into position again. And that's the director's job, to make sure that everyone's doing what they're supposed to be doing according to the screens that I see. Okay, well, what do you, like, sort of what do you do directing? I sit in the back room, and it's, uh, very, very large back room with sit. a lot of, yes, I do, I sit, and I have a lot of screens in front of me, a lot of buttons, and a lot of dials, and I'm allowed to touch those four buttons right there, and that's it. My job is to touch those four buttons, but I also have a headset and a microphone, and I have to talk to the camera people. What do and those I have four to buttons talk. do? Uh, they switch back and forth into different cameras. So practically all you do is push sit buttons. Sit down and press buttons. 
That would, be, that would be some people's dream job, probably. Well, you, you have to think a lot. You have How to make... long have you been uh, doing this kind of stuff? I've been in film production now for uh, 18 years. Uh, I started at going to school first, learning how to do this job. Uh, I used to work in, in props first, designing and creating props for movies. And then I started uh, producing. I became an animation producer and created a, a television show. And then I started directing. And when you go to animation school, you have to learn it all. Well, so directing is one of those things you have to learn. When? Oh, sorry, you go. Sorry. Um, uh, like, when did you realize that you wanted to direct? That's what I was going to say. When I went to film school, I talked to one of my teachers and asked them to criticize my student film. And he said it was the worst animation he's ever seen in his life. The line quality was terrible, and he basically said it was, uh, my animation was horrible. Was that sad? It was terrible. <laughs> I felt so bad. But then he looked at me and said, uh, you need to become a director or producer because this is the best story I've ever seen come out of the school. So I, I worked harder to become a director and producer. So you was lying about the bad? No, my animation was horrible. Absolutely. I will and never be an animator. <laughs> I'll, I'd, I'd rather be a director and producer and a creator and a writer. Well, we're just going to have to see that someday. Possibly, yes. So the animation stuff was bad, but the storyline to it was good? He loved the story. He thought it was so fantastic. So it's quality, not quantity. It is the quality, quality of the story, not quality the, uh, how, of the story. well big it is and how what it is. It's quality. Yes. That's what our teacher tells us. Yes. Oh, isn't it? On the subject of animation, yeah. why don't you discuss Raven Tales? Oh, <gasps> I love Raven. Well, not love, love, but I like the story of how he put the sun in the sky. That's the only one I've seen. But I like that. Well, we do have 25 more episodes. I'll tell my dad about that. Yeah. We'll have to share it with you one day. Yeah. But the first episode was really good. Thank you. I won over 30 International Film Festival awards for that one. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I would have given you a hug, but you're too far to reach. Yes. Salmon handshake. Oh, I forgot the salmon handshake. Absolutely. I don't know how that works. <laughs> and you, too. If well, I think that's what Will's trying to do is to, not necessarily a revolution, but trying to educate people about... Fishies? Fishes, fish, yes. Fishy awareness? Fish awareness. Oil spills are bad? <laughs> Oil spills are bad, yes they are. What's um, your favorite animal? What is my favorite animal? Well, raven, of course. What inspired you to do raven tales? My aboriginal culture. My love of raven and my love of song, dance, and story. I'm a butterfly. I'm a dragon, see? Well, be careful of wildy salmon because wildy salmon loves insects. We would like to thank Simon for spending his time to let us interview him and also for making Raven Tales. High five. As always, I'm Nitra. I'm Aisha. And this has been WSCN Wild Salmon Children's News. Hey kids! This is the Wildy Salmon Show here in the Wild Salmon Children's News Studio. I'm Wildy Salmon, of course, and we have Simon. He's an artist. How are you? I am well. How are you? Great. Thanks for coming on the program. Uh, so uh, we've got a, or we, no, myself, yes. We, well, we in the collective, we, all of us, Salmon, uh, would like to ask you about a number of things. Um, some, of, some of the disturbing past where you're a fisherman. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk to you about that. Also, um, being an artist. And then you're a, 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 a digital creator, animator, director, all those many things. So, um, but first, uh, let's, let's get your name. Simon Daniel James. And I'm also known as Wee Nudzi, or the Raider or Warrior, if uh, translated to English, yes. Uh, and so Wee Nudzi, that is? Um, a Kwakwala name. From that was given to me from my grandfather when I was uh, 17. He well, he waited that long. He waited that long. As we as Aboriginal people, we actually receive names as we progress in life. So normally you wouldn't even receive your first name until you were 10 months. Well, then how would you know like when to be called for dinner and stuff? You were just oh well, you're never late for dinner. Oh, you get in trouble if you're late for dinner in our house. Well, okay, that's and what would you eat? 
Well, smoked salmon. Barbecued salmon. Why did I ask? Salmon soup, salmon stew, oh. baked salmon. Are you there's done? a whole list. That's it? Oh, no. There's some, okay, I can uh, go on for hours. Uh, well, it's a short show, yes, so... Uh, we'll just narrow it down to, yeah. to cooked salmon. Okay, hold on. Let me just take a break. Okay, so um, you used to be a fisherman? I used to be a commercial fisherman in the commercial salmon fishing industry uh. and also the commercial herring fishing industry. And I was also a sports fisherman for uh, many years of my life. It's, it's a lot. Couldn't you just play video games or something like that? Well, I do that too. Oh. Okay. Um, and so um, how, how many fish would you catch at a time? Well, back then I caught, sadly, many, many of your ancestors uh, within the thousands at that time. And uh, we sold them to the market. No, seriously? Yeah. And they were put in these little cans. And then they were consumed by millions of people. How do, you, how very, do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? I'm ashamed. I'm sorry. Yeah? Yeah. It hurts right here. Yeah, but it was sure good. You're just rubbing it in. No, no. Oh. It, it, was, it was, I'm very ashamed. Yeah, I am very ashamed. You're smiling. I can see it. Well, actually, I did quit the salmon industry in 1994 because I, I didn't like the direction that the salmon industry was heading. I personally started fishing uh, in the commercial fishing industry when I was 11 years old. And then when I was 25 or 24, I started to see the depletion of the salmon stock. I didn't like that. So I decided that I was going to stop salmon fishing at that time. And so, um, so have you stopped uh, salmon fishing? I have stopped sa commercial salmon fishing, yes. Oh, okay. Well, that's good because at least, you know, if you kept going, I don't think we'd have this program. I wouldn't be talking here. No, you probably wouldn't be talking to me. No, yeah. So thank yourself that well, I'm here. No, uh, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You know, as, as my grandfather taught me, when we caught the very first salmon at the beginning of the salmon season, the first salmon that came over the stern of the boat, he ate it. He, mm. he cooked it. And yeah. it. It was an honorable thing, though. And then at the very last salmon, at the end of the season, because the, the government controls the, the season, uh, at the end of the season, he tossed the last salmon over back into the ocean. I was confused by this, so I asked him, as a young child, why did he throw the salmon over? And he said, it, it's so that the salmon will come back again next year. And maybe if, if we as humans practice these old ways now, then maybe we wouldn't be in s uh, such a bad situation. And maybe your species wouldn't be in such a bad situation. Yeah, maybe they could throw twice as many back. Or three times as or many. Three, yeah, hey, you know. Yeah, well, looks like we're on the same side there. So uh, you no longer uh, commercially fish, and um, you're uh, you're an artist. Yes. And um, you apparently you create fish digitally. Well, I I, I created uh, I, I co-created an animated television show called Raven Tales, where we actually do have digitally computer imaged uh, salmon. Uh, and no salmon, real salmon, were harmed in the making of raven tails. So uh, you should be very happy to know that. Yeah. So would you only create them during spawning season? Oh, no. You're around. Oh. Yeah. So, but it's not farmed. No. Never go near farm fish. It's, uh, no. Um, we like our salmon as wild as possible. Even our digitally enhanced salmon were wild salmon. And uh, would you make all the species of digitally uh, wild salmon? Oh, no. We make one and we just reproduce it many times in the computer. Wow. You're like, um, you're kind of like a mom. 99% of the humans on this planet can't tell the difference between salmon anyway. Oh, okay. So we didn't think that was important. Well, well thank you. So um, you, uh, you don't fish, you create digital, you're like a born again fisherman. Well, I didn't say I didn't fish. I still occasionally go sport fishing. Oh, for sport. Yeah, well, no, for eating still. Oh. I have children. I have to feed them. They love salmon. Oh. Well, they love all fish. Yeah, they, can you just, like, maybe love other ones? Can well, you just, like, can we convince them to just love your digital ones more? We are an equal opportunity house, so we do actually eat halibut and cod. Just and for the fun of it? Just for the halibut. That's good. Yes.
Do you flounder between halibut and salmon? Well, it depends on, on how flat we are, yeah. I'm laughing inside. Yeah, I know, and I'm crying inside. <laughs> that was a really bad joke. Huh? It's a fishing joke. <laughs> it's a fishing joke, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. So um, what, what is the biggest fish that um, you didn't catch? The biggest fish I didn't catch was about this big, but the one that I did catch was about this big. I don't think you're telling the truth. Wow. I remember when I was about 13 years old, I was fishing. I remember my uncle waking me up about 4 o'clock in the morning. And I, like, you don't wake a 13-year-old up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And I got into the little Zodiac, and we went uh, for a little ride. And I had my fishing line over. And I caught, well, I'm going to use the imperial measurement, but uh, a 42-pound salmon. That is bigger than you were, wasn't uh, it? Pretty much. Oh, yeah. It was uh, the biggest fish I ever caught in a line. And I was so proud of myself. Sorry. 42? 42. That is, like, you know, that's almost how much I weigh. Well, I, apparently I, I did remember catching one about 30 minutes later, which snapped my line. So my uncle said that was much bigger than the 42. But that was me, just so. That was probably you. Yeah. Yes. You got away. Yeah, I got the string here somewhere. Yeah. You can have it back. Can I have the hook back? Um, it's, I, I lost it. Okay. Yeah. So, well, that was 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah. No, I've ha I got a lot of stories of how, uh, you know the one they got away? Here uh, you are. Yeah, I've come back to haunt you. Yeah. Yeah, and actually say that it was, you know, just to kind of like, ha, I'm back. Thank you. So, um, what's it like being an artist? Uh, you know, I run into a lot of them, like they're, they got their fishy stories and, you know, it's, I want to know. Well, asking me how do I feel like being an artist is kind of like asking a truck driver, what's it like being a truck driver? It, it, it's nothing that I can really explain other than I am an artist. And I wake up in the morning like everyone else and, and you, you, you ingest food to survive, you drink water to survive, and then you create art which I call art, maybe somebody else looks at my work and, and doesn't think it's art. Uh, I haven't had that yet, but uh, it's good with the bad. Sometimes you do make a bad piece that you just don't want to show anybody. And sometimes you make a, a, an amazing piece that everyone just loves and adores. And you can either survive on it in today's ridiculous commercial system, or, or you can uh, enjoy it. Like I have a mask right now that I created that has interchangeable mouthpieces. So I can actually remove a mouthpiece and then change the character. And it's kind of like how politicians are. They change their mouth. And well, no, it. the face doesn't flip inside out. Oh. Just the mouthpieces change. Okay. Yeah, we don't change faces like politicians do. Uh, what we do, though, is change the character and we dance the mask. And that's what I do with this mask. I actually do performances. Wow. So I can entertain people. And that's one of the great joys and the reason why I started carving in the first place. Uh, I wanted to dance my own mask. That's pretty cool. Um, where did you learn that? Well, I learned from my father. I, I was 15 years old. I went to my father and asked him to help me buy my car when I was 16. And he said, well, okay, well, I'll teach you how to carve because I'm not going to help you buy a car. And I learned how to carve and, and, and sell it to this ridiculous commercial system. What's so ridiculous about it? It got you a car. <laughs> it got me a car, but still. Uh, right now we have the powers of the world who are hoarding this this metal and they put it into a hole in the middle of a city and then put people around it with guns and, and iron gates and then they call themselves wealthy. I think that culture and salmon and song and dance is much more valuable than gold. I wouldn't disagree with you. No, I think a lot of people wouldn't disagree with me. But they like me so much they eat me. <laughs> This is the problem. It's kind of like this uh, fishy dilemma here. Well, without sounding too uh, ridiculous, you are delicious. Why, thanks. Yes. No, keep your, uh, keep your distance. Um, <laughs> so any advice uh, for a fish and how I can find my watershed, knowing that um, you caught many, I actually need advice from you of how not to act to be caught by people that used to be like you. Swim like you stole it. Swim like I stole it. Yeah, whatever you stole. What did just, I steal? Whatever you stole, just swim as fast as you can like you stole something. Okay. 
and you'll eventually find your watershed. But if I steal stuff, then the random authority will, I, it's like a no-win situation. <sighs> well, the random authority are always going to be there. They're always going to be looking for us uh, and trying to find a reason to come after us, even if there is no reason to come after us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I will swim like I stole something, but not feel guilty. Never feel guilty. Just swim like. As long as you continue to do what you think is right and society doesn't look bad upon, never feel guilty about it. All right. That's uh, good advice. Thank you very much of how not to be caught by people that used to be like you but act like I'm stealing something. Break their line like you did when I was 13. Yes. That's, it's good to go back in history and remember all the good things. Yes. Well, thanks, Simon. Appreciate you not fishing um, and also being a digital creator of salmon. Uh, but, you know, maybe you can convince your kids not to eat so much of me. We'll see what we can do. All right. See you later. I'm Wildy Salmon. See you next time.
On May 3rd, the Wilde Salmon Crew joined our friends from CJSF 90.1 FM at the Noonan's Creek Fingerling Festival. Watch Wilde Salmon as he investigates whose watershed he is in. Yo, Wildy Salmon here at the Fingerling Festival in Port Moody, which is also, uh, well, his territory would this be, I guess. Uh, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, holiday season. Quiquitlam and Katie. Katie, all right. So, and then over here is someone else, and then over here is, no, it's all good. Yeah. All right, so uh, what's your name, sir? My name is Mr. Sam, Dean Sam. My ancestral name is Stilok that comes from uh, northern part of Vancouver Island. Oh, you're in Chanas or Kakiwakwa? Uh, no, a little bit uh, Nanaimo and uh, Sardlip, Coast Salish. Okay. Yeah, sa Salish seas get you covered, eh? Yes. Nice. For sure. Well, I'm Wildy Salmon. Nice to meet you. The Salmon Fish Bump. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done the Salmon. Yeah, it's like that. And then the Salmon Arm. Hello. Yeah. Cool. I see him. I see you. I see him. 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 I squalor and chillouks at CM. Oh, CM. Hi, my name's Will. How are you doing? It's the salmon fish bump. The salmon fish bump. And then the salmon arm. Yeah. There we go. So, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you for allowing us to spawn our cameras and our territory here. So, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. It was a treat to come down, share a little bit of the opening for the salmon release, and uh, yeah, I'm excited. You released them, eh? Did yes, they released them and they're still releasing them. Nice. So how many thousands are going to deliver? I think uh, I must underestimate. I'm going to say at least 20,000 easy. 20,000? Yes. I hope they'll look like me after they've done. Oh, I think so if they make it that far, yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, do you, you eat salmon, eh? Oh, definitely. It's a big, big part of our diet, but uh, it's a minimal because of you know, governance and stuff, but we do our best. Yes, well, us, us salmon got to survive many threats, political, industrial, indigenous, hungry people. So we, we got we got our work cut out for us, but uh, we thank the indigenous people for protecting our mother Earth. So uh, yes. we, got, we, we got a good reporter, <laughs> but still sometimes, you know, it's like, you know, we got to outrun you guys. So. That's right, that's right. Because, so, you, know, you know, we as indigenous people, we are people of the land, not necessarily owners, but preservers of the land. And that including, includes many of the species that come up and down the Fraser River. Do you have a favorite? Uh, I'm going to have to say the sockeye. Oh, man. I don't, know what, I don't know what species I am right now. <laughs> I don't even know what gender, if I, if I am spawning or if I have eggs. I only figure it out when I get there. Yeah. So, um, how are you doing today in this beautiful <laughs> facility? I can't complain because uh, about an hour or so ago, we are at home closer to our territory of Keatsy, and we did an opening ceremony for a little park area, like neighboring right next door to our territory. So, And then to come here, see all the beautiful people acknowledging and respecting the salmon, phenomenal. Nice. So uh, <laughs> what do you have here? I have a deer hide drum made from my cousin, representing uh, Part of my family and his family, the Raven Clan. And you have different clans, so you don't uh, you don't interbreed. Is that the whole thing? Or? Yeah. Well, I guess that when I say clans, today in this lifestyle, we have first and last names. Back then, it was the clans that identified our families: the wolf, bear, eagle, salmon, whale. Depends on what territory or whereabouts you uh, lived in. I think I'd be part of the Salmon Clan. I think so, yes. But I like the Raven Clan. Yeah. They tell a lot of jokes. Yeah, they're Transformers and they are tricksters. Yes. Are there half-breeds, like half Raven, half Salmon? Or yes, definitely. Oh, there are. Because my wife and I, interacting, uh, coagulating, connecting, she comes from Sawbell, which is a type of duck, and I'm the Raven, so my kids would be half Raven and half Sawbell. Oh, there you go. Well, I, I'm half human, half Salmon. There so we go. See, that's how it all works. So I, now I figure out my, it's a whole existential crisis for me. Yeah. That's right. All right, so you're going to play a song? I'm going to sing you the salmon song. Oh, nice. You mind if I dance? You go right ahead. All right, I get to dance. <laughs> okay. In the next segment, Indigenous artist, director, producer, long-term activist, and co-founder, 
of the annual Missing and Murdered Women Memorial March, Kelly White tells a bit about her history. Hey kids, welcome. It's Wildy Salmon here in the Wild Salmon Children's new studio. We have Kelly White with us, joining us today. How are you? Good, good to see you. Good to see you too. And uh, the salmon handshake. So this beautiful blanket is yours, I understand. You have a story around it? We sure do. Oh. Well, the star quilt derives, I was taught from the Cree in uh, Hobima, Alberta, as well as the Lakota in Rosebud, South Dakota. And they recreated the star blanket around World War II for healing and doctoring of the veterans when they returned from the war in shell shock, homeless and without medicines. The, the great grandmothers and grandmothers made the star quilt for the veterans to go top of the mountain, fasted four days, and came down and sundanced for four days. And the one for their vision quest, for their name, for their song, uh, their blessings from Creator, and the will within themselves. And the one that they wanted to honor for helping their entire life, they were, the, they were given the blanket after the, in honor of their survival, in honor of their work for their people. And in those days, not everybody could be, you had to be asked and you had to show that you were honorable and you had to be asked by the people to dance for the, for the nation's honor and protection. So that's where the blankets come from. And I wanted to bring it to Art Sound Therapy Studio. And I was honored to be invited to show the world unity on there, the red, white, black, and yellow depict the four seasons of the year were the salmon, the deer, the, the crawlers of the earth, and the two-legged. The colors also depict the four nationalities of the four, four directions of the world, all life, and the tiny tots to the teens, adults, and the grandparents' lifespan of, uh, of healing and promotion of working in unity together. That's the definition of the Lakota and Cree elders. Wow. And there's a lot in that blanket. There is. There's a lot of honor. Mostly healing of the nations and united resistance to apathy and giving up. It's to strengthen and lift up the, the family, the recipients. So kind of like the unity in the world. It's kind of like like the fish swimming around all the different parts of the earth, eh? That's right, like the schools. They all travel in schools together and protect each other and look out for each other. And There's no gospel or written document or mandate or anything. It's just a given. The Creator gives the gift of honor and protection and shelter to look out for each other, it's just, like, just like the salmon people. Cool. So uh, I understand um, you like to make bannock. Oh, I love to make bannock. The, my mom fed communities from hundreds to our small family of eight. And whenever there was two people in the house, she always had the bread on the table and big pot of soup and, and uh, water, clean water, right from the cleanest water in the land and to hospitality, and, and uh, mom taught us that it was a privilege to, to cook for the people and have good thoughts and uh, a good heart in preparing the food so that you're strengthening the ones that, it's, it's an honor for people, a privilege to learn how to make that bread and how to provide food from the land and, and to strengthen the, the, the people that come to nourish off that, that's medicine itself, in watching the people to become stronger, eating that nourishment from, from the gods, from the land, air and the sacred water. 
And I'd heard that salmon and bannock go together a lot. Is Ooh. this true? They sure do. Oh, no. <laughs> One of the best dishes in the land. Sought after in the world will be. People pay flights around the world to come to the West Coast to see our salmon and our bannock tab on the table. Hmm. Well... Maybe I should stay away from Bannock, because then I'm likely to be consumed. Well, it would be a good idea, because we need Will D. Salmon to help our, our people, kind, our people types, to learn more about the watersheds and the safety and how we can all work together to protect the water and the sacredness of life. Well, maybe you convince the others not to eat me so I can keep telling the stories. Oh, well, I don't have a big enough law to keep this fisher people away, but I would go with the current and stay with the clean part of the current, and, and, and that would be safe. I don't think people would want to be fishing around polluted waters and the tide, you know, the ocean tide coming in and the river tide going out. I'd stay right in that current because people don't want to fish around polluted water or oil slicks or, you know, sulfur on the water. You got to be sneaky and... I got to dodge a lot. Yeah, you got to dodge a lot when you're a salmon. So, uh, and I heard um, you like serving salmon at your celebrations. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I, I got a problem with this. <laughs> well, it's one of the biggest delights of the world community to come to the coast. We even have water... Water for Life group around the world that are all singers. Oh yeah, what's that about? Musicians united to save the environment right from the late 1970s. And we have a local chapter in Vancouver since the early 1980s, Water for Life. And we just like will the salmon types and like to go around and tell people, help people to understand water is sacred and life is good and sacred and to enjoy that and work with the personality of the plants and, and the water, the, pe the ones that live in the water and the two-leggeds and the four-leggeds that live on the land. We, we just like to promote unity and nothing wrong with living with peace and thankfulness. Well, I couldn't disagree with you about clean water. I think we're, we're good there. And uh, so that's cool. And, and I've also heard that we're kind of related. Is this true? We're humans and fish and we're all connected? Is this? Well, the Creator gives us a, a good life and we are blessed to have. Mom and Dad always taught us to be thankful, get up with the sunrise and give thanks for all our relatives that live in the water, our relations that eagles and they're, they're ravens, the ones that fly, and our relatives that, that nourish us too, the four-legged, the elk and the deer. Those are family members, the ones that, that run on the earth, the wolves and spiders. The spiders are a part of the star stories, the tricksters. But we're all related. The Creator gave us a, a good mind and a good heart to work with all our relations sacred to all life. Yeah, I wonder if we're related by, uh, by blood or marriage. Mm, well, your sequins are, you know, natural. I have to go to the store and buy mine. So I'd say we're long-distance relatives. You know? All right. I don't know how to fish shake anyway. Yeah, well, that, that's cool. All right, well, thanks for sharing all your stories. I know you do a lot of work in the community, and uh, i got to outrun some of your fisher friends to make it up my watershed. So do you got any tips for the salmon about how to find my watershed? Well, open your eyes. Underwater? <laughs> Underwater. You could see the watershed every day, Will. But I don't think it's the only place for, for Will D. Salmon. Our people need Will D. Salmon out there, too, to share the good news and to learn from our children. And we like that. All right, cool. Well, thanks for coming on the program. I know you're really busy. We'll see you soon. Highest of the honors. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Kelly. Kelly White.
In the next segment, our Wild Salmon Children's News reporter, Nitra, will do an interview with Martin Sparrow, Indigenous artist, all-round interesting fellow. Enjoy the interview. Hello, my name is Nitra. I'm with the WSCN, and I'm here today uh, interviewing Martin Sparrow, and he is a, one of the great to carver. I'm pretty good. So I've been carving for probably about 12 years and um, I was a fisherman at first for, I fished for almost maybe 30 years out in the uh, Fraser River. So I kind of feel, you know, through the years as I was fishing that uh, it got harder and harder to go out there and fish because of, you know, the government always had control over it. So and when I realized it was getting harder and harder to be out there fishing, um, you needed another income. So I got into carving over 12 or 14 years ago. So I just do it just to uh, keep in balance about who I am. I am from Musqueam and um, been uh, feeling kind of distance, you know, from my own land, you know, because I grew up and the city wasn't that big when I was a little boy, but I always had a hard time, you know, with my mom and dad and because of residential school and um, my grandparents, they, they never told us very much because of, uh, you know, the, our culture of carving and the culture of ceremonies that we, we used to do. So as the years, the early 40s, whatever, they, they're, they're taking our culture away. They, they took away a lot of our language, you know, for the last hundreds of years in residential school. So my father was never taught by my grandfather because of what was happening to the children. You said you've been talking a lot about residential schools. What are they exactly? The government put the residential school there because of, they took children away when they're five years old and they brought them to a residential school. They took them away from the parents, trying to take their culture out of them, their language, the carving, all the different ceremonies that we used to do, the singing. So it kind of defeated our people for hundreds of years, you know, that um, when they took away our culture, they took away our, our, our identity. So my identity was kind of lost there for a while to figure out my name was Martin Sparrow. Where did the Sparrow name come from? It was a guy from England. His name was John Sparrow that married my great-grandmother. And that's where the Sparrow name came from. You know, so we're all given um, English names because we had native names at one time. So I never did get a native name because of... Um, my, my mom and dad didn't believe in what was going on in Moscow. So my mom was from Seashell. So the, the culture was just a little bit different, you know, from there to here. And it's not even that far away. Salish people are, are from, partly some of it's from down the States all the way to some on the island and some all the way up to Campbell River area where there are Salish people. So we, we had a different way of carving. Kelly is also the producer of one of our upcoming shows, The Stories from the Salish Seas. Stay tuned for upcoming shows. Up the rivers of life, endlessly, they always return to the place they began for a million years. They swam and swam and swam.
emotions that are like us. Drums that sound clear across the foam. They are calling their children, calling their children home. The salmon circle from the sea to the sea, up the rivers of life. Endlessly, they always return. That's about it for this hour. We've been your hosts, Angela and Gregor. Join us on Sunday at 1 a.m. where you can find another episode of the Wildy Salmon Show. And weekdays for Sound Therapy Arts TV with Rika Jasper. Hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>